Welcome everyone. Welcome back to the Trader Continuum. Glad you're here with us today. Special guest in the studio with me, Gordon Scott, is Scott Cook. Scott's a uh, longtime friend and uh, trading guru and has a particular kind of trading expertise that we're pretty excited to have him show off live today. We'll uh, be getting to that in a moment. To begin with, we're going to let you know that uh, today we have three different segments. I'm going to go through some market information and we're going to uh, work with Scott and look at his specialty looking at low priced and penny stocks. And then we're going to look at some Forex stuff and that's going to be kind of our main thing today. Does that uh, sound okay to you, Scott? Sounds good. I'm excited. Right. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, to begin with, I want to just tell you, remind you kind of what we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks. This 56 week pattern setup is in play and uh, we can, uh, if we can look at a, a chart to, at that, then maybe we can figure out uh, uh, where we are. But the, the main thing is that um, we are on a trajectory. And despite the fact that we've kind of come back a little bit today in the market, we started high, came back lower, a little bit of a, a bearish engulfing pattern. Uh, nothing, nothing dire, but it's still low volatility. And when you get a low volatility bearish engulfing pattern, the important thing to recognize is what a high probability bullish setup that is. And so um, we'll, uh, we'll have a look at, at, at that if we can. The, um, the thing that I wanted to make sure everybody knows about is that the uh, 20, well, I'm going to get my list up here too, 24 stocks, most influential in the market. Uh, most of them look bearish today because, well, I mean, most of them are down today because of uh, the fact that uh, those, um, I mean, because the market is, the, the Dow is down and, and the other two are kind of flat. Um, but uh, that, th th there are a couple of stocks that are actually green. They're, you know, doing all right. They're, they're actually going up today. And on a day like today where you have sort of a mild downward move, the stocks that are in your watch list that are also going up, you really want to pay attention to those. That means they've got some sort of extra buoyancy, extra uh, relative strength, and, um, and that is, is going to, uh, well, I'm just going to call them out here real quick. I don't know if we can uh, show them to you or not, but uh, uh, what we're looking at really quick is Amgen is up 1.2%, uh, JP Morgan and um, Bank of America, both the financial stocks, uh, they're up, um, uh, well, yeah, 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 they're up over a percent. So, so the strength is the, under the surface is, is kind of there. Disney's up a little, but it's really not that much, which is kind of surprising because Disney's been weak. And so the fact that we see it today uh, with some strength is, is interesting. Oh, okay, so here's our chart. Uh, but, but as we're recognizing, we've got this, uh, this is our trajectory. Will stocks move quite, uh, you know, directly along that line? Don't know. Uh, don't try to predict the future. Just try to forecast and get ready for it and respond to it. What we're looking at right here, though, is the fact that we have this engulfing, or at least the, the bodies are engulfed. We don't have an engulfment of the whole range. When, when you see stocks come down like this, especially at, at, at an old resistance, this is a very nearby resistance, but you know, previous nonetheless, then, then we know, okay, hey, there's selling pressure at this point. How much selling pressure though? See, look at that. And look at that volume, right? We're, we're uh, almost to the close of the day. We've got 20 minutes to close of the day and, and just like half of the normal volume. This is a really weak sell-off. So uh, buyers come back and sellers uh, panic and get out and and close their short trades, what do you think is going to happen, right? So, so I really think that as, as bad as this looks, this looks really good. If you're a bull, if you're a market bull, you're loving this. We broke out of uh, this kind of, you know, downward trend or double bottom or whatever you want to call it, broke out, kind of retested the breakout, coming back up, and, and, and this is all they got? This is all the bears got? You know, so I think we're in pretty good shape. And you want to pay close attention to uh, what's doing well. Really quick, we looked at the uh, 3M trade yesterday. Ah, 
just exactly why we said, wait, and here we are coming back down. This is fabulous. We love this. Why? Because we want a better entry. We want to get closer to that old low, maybe even below the old low before we pick this up. But, but the reality is that at some point there's this really low risk, very high reward potential uh, for a stock like uh, you know 3M, who's part of the Dow, part of the S&P 500, one of the most influential stocks out there because of, of uh, its position and how much is, uh, of um, institutions are holding it and so forth. Um, and uh, we're, so we're really looking close at that trade. It's coming probably sometime this week, maybe next week or two, we'll see. Uh, now, just to sort of set up Scott here, I want to tell you, I am having a great day personally in the markets. And, and any of you who've been watching us uh, frequently, you know why. Uh, and that is because I put on this trade, uh, Blue Apron or APRN, as a penny stock, that is a stock under $5 a share, low cost stock, right? And, um, and then I added to it because that's uh, my methodology. If I get that opportunity to, uh, I, I love to do it. Well, you love it in a day, uh, you know, in, in a, a day in the markets like this, you love because the rest of the market is sort of flat or down. But if you're holding a penny stock that you have carefully planned, and, and carefully scoped out and, and looked, set up the right risk and, and found the right possible reward, then your account is going forward while the market is stuck in neutral, right? And, and uh, this is just doing great for me, especially because I got a double position going on and, uh, and I'm loving it. And we're, we're gonna close out very close to the high. Now, how do you find stocks like this? And what do you do with them when you find them? Well, I don't know about the how you find them bit, but uh, we're going to go definitely over the part of what do you do with them when you find them. And uh, besides all that, we're going to give you a whole bunch of ideas. So to do that, let's, uh, let's introduce Scott Cook to you. If you haven't seen him before on one of our broadcasts or, or heard us talk about him yet, hopefully you're going to get excited to, to do this. So Scott, how long have you been trading penny stocks? Ooh, I've been doing penny stocks for close to 20 years now. 20 years. Okay, so not a beginner here. And you might hear stuff that's not beginner stuff, but don't worry. Scott's very good at uh, keeping it real. He's going to uh, break it down for you. The 20 years, in the 20 years you're doing it, have you seen a better time to be in penny stocks uh, than, uh, well, I, 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 maybe there have been, but to me it seems like there's a lot of penny stock opportunities just lighting off all over the place. Is it one of the better times you've seen in the past 20 years? There's great opportunities all the time with penny stocks, but lately, uh, especially with the marijuana stocks, mm. man, all sorts of opportunities. So yeah, yeah, now's a great time to be into it. Okay, cool. So uh, you've got a few charts, uh, a few ideas of, of things you're going to show us, right? Oh yeah. Yep. Oh, why don't we just jump right into them? Okay. Yeah, so what I did is I assembled a list of uh, 20 stocks, and I thought it would be kind of fun to, to take a look at some of these stocks. Um, I don't know that we're going to have time to go through all of them, but what I do is I go through a watch list, and when I get the right setups, bam, there's a trade. So one of the ways I'm assembling these watch lists is I'm going through and I'm seeing who is hot, um, but at the same time, I also follow a group of stocks because there's a story to them. And if there's a good story, then I'm going to trade that stock in a, a certain way. So Gordon and I were actually having fun talking about Apron. I'm going to bring it up right now, Blue Apron. And um, when we sat down, I noticed that that was one of the stocks on his watch list. I kind of started laughing and said, hey, you know what? I've been trading this recently, and it looks like our entries were very similar. And so what we did is um, you, know, you see right here, and with penny stocks, it's all about the breakout. Um, if you get something that's moving, it's past a previous high on good volume, it's got positive momentum, and it's likely to carry that forward. And Gordon said that he was pretty happy with today's move. Well, I want to reiterate that he's going to be very happy because usually with penny stocks, um, if that thing closes near the high of the day with good volume, that energy is going to translate over to the next day, likely you're going to see the thing gap up and continue running. So I would expect that tomorrow is going to be another good day for Blue Apron. 
Unfortunately, I'm I... happy to hear that, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you definitely should be. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you're in a penny stock and you've, uh, you've got a decent sized position, you're always going to be super thrilled to see the thing move. You can make yeah, money yeah. really fast on these guys. So, um, yeah, this thing uh, looks like it has a little bit more room to run. But one of the things that we were talking about before we, we started uh, rolling here is that with penny stocks, I like to get out really quick. I've got a little saying, third day in play, collect your pay. Because a lot of these pops, in fact, if you look at Blue Apron in the past, whenever you get a good spike, um, generally, you're going to want to take some profits. You don't want to be holding it too long. Now, maybe this is the time this runs all the way back up to $6 a share, but I was out. I took a nice profit. And sometimes you just got to be happy with the profit. And it's frustrating to see the thing go on without you, but bottom line is you made money. Yeah. So you should be happy. Okay. I'm going to bring up, uh, are you familiar with uh, any of the cannabis stocks by any chance, Gordon? I'm not. So oh. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing about this. Okay. So I've been following them pretty closely. Um, I actually took part in the big January run-up. Um, everybody was excited about um, California legalization. And so you saw pot stocks all across the board just have this massive run-up. In fact, this one is one that I really have followed since the early days. I got in at about 67 cents a share, and I didn't do this on any kind of a breakout. This was more based on um, research on the company itself. So I'm going to see if I can get my, uh, my mouse button here. I'm going to draw a little bit of a line. Okay, you can see that this did break out, and that would have been a great entry. I got in a little early based on what I knew about the company, based on their business model. I thought it had a lot of potential. And if anyone's familiar with it, have you ever heard of Silver Wheaton? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, same model. Um, and help me out with that, because I thought Silver Wheaton was like uh, this uh, supplier. They just basically bought and sold contracts. How would you do that with cannabis? So they help smaller mining companies. They, they give them some funding, and then they basically take um, a, a stream of, of what's produced. Well, that's what these guys are doing. They're getting little cannabis companies off the ground. And banks, you know, a lot of really? these So they're not a pot grower. They're a, a, a startup, marijuana company startup uh, helper. Uh-huh, yep. Wow. And a lot of people are kind of nervous because they're like, all right, so they're helping these little uh, companies try to get off the ground. You know, banks aren't funding these guys. So is this kind of like an ETF for very high risk, you know, little, yeah, little pot yeah. stocks? Well, one of the things I like about these guys is their uh, management. Um, one of the guys that, that founded this company, he actually uh, founded uh, um, Canopy Growth. And they're one of the, the successful uh, marijuana stocks so far. And this guy's actually been called the godfather, godfather of weed in Canada. So <laughs> they've got management, and he has connections. Um, they've got management that I really, based on my research, you know, I, I, I think that there's a lot of potential here. So okay. it's one that based on the business model, um, based on the management, a lot of factors have gone into this. And I thought, hey, you know what? Why not? They're in kind of a consolidation phase through here. Took a position. And then uh, not long, it, it broke out. I could have waited. I could have gotten in on the breakout, but I was in early, and I was, I was happy with that. So ran up huge. Now, one of the problems with the model, um, the business model here, is they you know, are funding smaller companies. They're, they're trying to get them going, so they have to issue shares. Yeah. And we've talked about dilution. Um, dilution can be a terrible thing for the stock price, but it can also be a blessing in disguise in certain situations. So they had a huge run up. Everybody was super excited, um, but they've had to sh sell shares to operate their business model. They've come back down, and you can see there's a lot of consolidation in the area that they've right, been in. Right, right. Now, this is one of those unique trading opportunities. It doesn't fit a certain pattern. I, I, I like to, to do breakouts. I like to trade certain uh, patterns, and I found that that's really the best way to be successful with penny stocks. Get in and out pretty fast. However, this one, I've, uh, I've actually been interested in building a position. So 
I've got a certain amount of shares that I'm going to hold because I don't want to miss the boat when these guys do take off. And, you know, I, I think at some point in the future they will. Yet, at the same time, you can see there's a little bit of a channel that they trade within. Right. So just knowing the way this stock trades, hey, buy in near a dollar fifteen. If you can get it near a dollar ten, great. Um, hold tight for a week or two, you'll get a spike up over a dollar twenty. You know, maybe get out at a dollar twenty-five, a dollar twenty-eight, a dollar thirty. Repeat process. It, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Wow. That's that's really interesting, and you know what else grabs my eye at this? Looking at this chart over, it, it's a much bigger time frame. But years and years ago, when you first introduced me to the idea of penny stock trading, um, the 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 technique that you told me about was actually in evidence in the same part that you're sharing. So we're we're, we're looking here on the chart where in, in January it runs up and there's a huge volume clump right there, and then the volume tapers off, but even as it tapers off back to its low through March and April in, in that area, uh, in, you know, right in there, right? It's higher than where it was. And that was the key thing that, that I remember you telling me about is like, if we get a big run up and it pulls back, but that volume doesn't go away, then get ready, it's probably got another leg up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, are you seeing that, that same kind of pattern here? I mean, so it's, it sounds to me like you're talking about building this position in anticipation of another jump. Absolutely, yep. Uh, not only do I like the business model, but I love what the chart's showing me. Volume precedes price. And so, yeah, a lot of enthusiasm right in this area with all the volume spiked up. Yeah, yeah there's gonna be some profit taking, but you can see that it's come back down, it's consolidated for a while, and I'm just waiting for it to take off again and, and um, you know, have another leg up. And I think on the next leg up, it's going to be much bigger. So one more thing I want to try and bring out here. Um, you mentioned the business model. So marijuana stocks, business model, there are a couple of gears that just don't click in my head when I hear those words. What I'm thinking about is, first, okay, it's kind of, do people really make money uh, selling marijuana itself or do they have to distill it? I mean, first off, okay, if you're just going to grow marijuana, marijuana is a weed. I mean, there's a reason it got, its nickname is weed. You know, it just it grows anywhere, more humid places, it grows even better, but anybody can grow it. If all of a sudden it's legal, you have massive supply uh, capabilities. You know, how do you whittle down? To if you're a company, you say we've got something better than you know uh, Joe Hippie who who has been growing it for the past 30 years and, and has 500 acres of, of nothing but weed, right? Uh -huh. So so how do you do that? Second thing is um, okay, maybe you found something, but there's a, with all of the attention and all of the legalization, there's a ton of people rushing at this. How do you differentiate and? Uh, I mean, I get, I get what you're talking about here. These guys are basically the investors in the startups, but even whether it's them or the startups themselves, what, what do you look for in a business model that actually sounds long-term or even survivable and legitimate to you? Great question. So I'm not the, uh, the weed expert, but based on my research, um, you know, there's, there's certain companies receive lic licenses um, and not all of them are going to get them. And so some are licensed uh, throughout Canada to distribute in certain uh, territories. And uh, the ones that didn't get the licenses, you know, they've got to find other ways uh, to distribute their, their, their produce. Um, so there's that. There's, um, uh, well, you, you, look a lot, you look at a lot of the companies and, all right, so are they going to be able to brand their product? Um, what's going to differentiate this product versus uh, some of the other guys? Uh, distribution, you know, what kind of channels do they have lined up? Um, one of the things I like about this company is with their streaming model, they're going to have access to a huge amount of cannabis and they've actually got um, other companies that they're doing business with that they can distribute it and um, basically their, uh, their margins are actually going to be a lot better than a lot of the companies, uh, you know, based on my research and based yeah. on what, what I, I what think. What you hear people saying and what the numbers you're looking at and so forth. And obviously there's, there's a lot of risks. I mean, we yeah. don't know exactly what's going to happen here. Um, I've read articles talking about how there's going to be an oversupply. I, I've read articles saying no way. Um, there, there's, 
we're not going to have an oversupply for at least five years down the road. So it's, it's okay. tough. New industry, it's going to be tough, but you know, sometimes you just got to take a risk and go for it. So is this a pink sheet stock or is it uh, one of those uh, uh, venture, uh, QB venture stocks that, I mean, is it reporting regularly? It's really the bottom Yes, um, they're, they're not on the pink sheets. Yeah. So they're, okay. they're a little bit more transparent with their financials. Okay, good. That's, that's good. So you can actually get that kind of information. Well, sorry to hold you up. Why don't we go ahead and, and plow through uh, some, the ones you've got, but uh, that one's really interesting. Well, I've got a lot, and I'm basically going off of this list over here on the left-hand margin. Um, you know what? Since we're talking about pot stocks, I'm going to be kind of quick here. Um, I'm going to bring up this one, and you can see uh, wow. right about here they broke out. Uh, I took a position, and again, get in, get in quick. Um, take your profits. I was unable to capture this full move. I ended up getting out at a, a dollar, was a little bit worried about that even number, thought we might have some resistance there and might pull back a little bit further. Um, but hey, I made a good profit, I was happy with it. Yes. And um, you know, they're, they're still moving right now, a lot of volume, uh, it's on the way up. We're getting way overextended, so at some point there's gonna be a, a, a reckoning here, but bottom line is there's a lot of positive momentum. And uh, yeah, let's, let's ride it, let's see how far it's gonna take us. Cool, very cool. Um, one of the things I, I did here, and, and I've got a couple of pot stocks on my watch list, but I thought I'd have some fun and bring up a recent, um, if the stock moves big on high volume, chances are at some point down the road, it's going to do it again. And I'm going to zoom in on this one. See, this was a runner. Huge, huge volume. Big move, it, it did that whole consolidation kind of trade in the channel for a while, yeah. and then again, another Giant breakout. Big move, yeah. So right now, I don't want to touch it. It's on the way down, um, but let's see what happens near five dollars a share. Let's see Hold if it can start resistance. holding its ground. Yeah. You know, find find a little bit of a base, and then um, you know it might trade in a bit of a channel, and, and right. you know we might have a trade at, at some point down the road. But what I want to stress here is. When you see this thing, it's a low float stock, so you know it's going to be volatile. Uh -huh. yes. that, that's why it moves so far, so fast. Um, yeah, low float penny stocks. Yeah, yeah, got to love those. They can make you money in a hurry. They can also lose you money in a hurry, so make sure that uh, you're, you're, you're out. Do you, speaking of that, do you mind if I, if I uh, jump you in on that, uh, jump in on that, that subject? If you have um, a low float stock, and you know, hey, this thing is really going to move. And I'm going to look at this, like in this case here. Let's suppose you want to get in somewhere between 5 and 550. You manage to pick up 515. And you're thinking, well, you know, if it breaks 5, then I'm a little nervous. I know it can go all over the place, so I'm going to give it some room. I'm going to give it to 450, right? But you're really hoping it's, it's heading back up into 12 plus. And so you've got 50 cents the downside. Uh, $7 the upside, right? Your, your trade set up. Uh -huh. yep. but, um, but because it's a low float stock, uh, do you ever think about how much um, you might be at risk if price comes down and you know just blows right past your stop? Have you ever had that happen to you? Not a gap, not an overnight gap, mm -hmm. but just middle of the day, it just goes running past you. What, what kind of risk are people at when they're trading low? Absolutely. Stocks? So, I mean, your stop losses aren't going to necessarily save you. Um, in fact, I think this stock was actually halted a few times throughout the trading day, which Yikes. can be kind of scary. Yeah. Um, so you think you're going in with a 50 cent risk and you end up, you know, getting hit with a, you know, a dollar or a dollar 50. They, they can move fast. So yeah, there is greater risk, greater reward. Okay. Um, so do you do anything to try to protect yourself? In other words, if you were to say, I'm going to make sure that my 50 cent stop loss, hypothetical, I don't know that it's going to hold, right? I can set that as if that's going to be, you know, 1%. So I only buy enough shares that if I lose that much, I've only got 1% of my account at risk. But, you know, if I lose two or three times that, well, okay, two to 3%, that's going to hurt, but that's, that's not going to happen every time. So I'm okay. I mean, that's the way I would do it. Do you do, that, do anything different? You actually hit the nail on the head. That's exactly how okay. I do it. It's okay. like, you know what? Hey, this is a this is a riskier one. Yeah, it, it'd be nice to load the boat and, and try to hit a home run, but no, that's uh, that's a great way to take a good system and and ruin it with poor money management. So, it's all about uh, taking a, taking a smaller position. And hey, you know what? I'm going to position size so that if if it hits my stop, 
I should lose 1% of my account. If it gaps past that, you know, yeah, I'm not happy about it. I might yeah. lose more, but at least it didn't wipe me out. How, how long would you say, I don't know if that's the right question, but you'll get what I mean. At what point did you finally say, I know I could load my entire account into this, and if it goes great, I could double the account or better, but that's, that's not what I oh, want to do. I yeah. just, it's too risky. I make more money if I hold to my rules and, and you know, I just, I put in the right amount so I can sleep at night or whatever, right? I mean, how, how much effort did it take to get to that point? Or was it not a problem for you? Um, so, no, it wasn't a problem, but it was, uh, you know, I, I would take positions that were a little too large and um, they say never fall in love with the stock. And there were a couple of stocks, you know, we, we looked at that cannabis Wheaton earlier and it, it's hard not to love the business model and stuff like that, but I mean, you saw it come down from over $2 a share to where it's at right now at about $1.20. If you would have fallen in love with the stock and mortgaged your house and yeah, bought 100,000 right, shares right. at $2 a share, I mean, you'd be hurting right now. Yeah, and yeah. you're losing sleep. You, you just can't do that. In fact, I want to show you real quick. Um, here's another stock. This is a, basically blockchain AI. You, you get exposure oh, to them. Nice. Um, right here, this massive drop. I felt like, hey, this is, this is overdone. Um, you know, there's, it, it was basically the, the revenue projections were, were off and they were off by quite a bit. And, um, you know, the market didn't like it. Huge sell off. And at about $1.50, right in this area, I thought, you know what? In fact, I had a buy order sitting at $1.50. I'm like, you know, I, I can uh, really load up on this because I'm pretty sure this is going to be a double within the next month or two. And um, didn't do it. Wanted to play it safe because I've got a good set of rules that consistently make me money. Yeah. I, I hit these little base hits over and over. Um, so yeah, I could have hit the home run on this. I could have doubled the account if I would have put it all into it. Yeah. Um, so but, there, it was just like you expected, it did double. Did double. And almost hardly at all pulled back for a penny stock all that way up. But the amount of sleep I would have lost along the way, not worth it. And you know, this is a penny stock. Yeah. Most penny stocks end up failing long term. And so even though I was pretty confident down here at $1.50, I mean, who's to say it didn't, you know, it wouldn't drop to 70 cents right, or right. 50 cents? Hind right. Hindsight is not proof that we actually did know what was going to happen. In, in fact, I've come to believe, and you tell me what you think of this, the worst thing that could have happened to me would be in a stock like that where I predicted the exact move and said, I'm going to just throw everything into there, caution to the wind, all my risk, put it in there. The worst thing that could have happened is that I would win. Yeah, because on your next trade, you on the next again, trade, and it's, it's going to be wiped out. Yes, yep, exactly. Yes, that's right. That's and right. you're going to have more money to lose. Yeah, that's right. Trade, that's right. right. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to hurt even worse. <laughs> yeah, over the, over time as a system, you will actually lose more money if you have success making risky bets. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I've seen. Yeah, you can bet it all on on one hand, but you know you win that hand. If you know how to count cards and estimate decks, don't bet it all again on the next hand. Yeah. You know, use use your card counting system to consistently make you money. That's very uh, that's good. What you cool. Do these cool. Days. What else you got? Okay, so I'm going to bring up uh, one other here, and I'd love to take you through all of these, but I'm going to bring up this. It, this one's volatile. Uh, let's see if I can uh, get it here real quick. Give me one second. Okay, now. The reason I wanted to talk about this, um, just consistently in the past, every time it gets near the $1 mark, I'm going to draw a line across that here. Let's just draw it all the way across the chart. This thing bounces up. Now, I have to admit, I bought it at $1 right in this area, right where my cursor is. And it dipped below it, and I thought, oh, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. I got out with a small loss. But, hey, it was a tiny loss. It was no big deal. Yeah. And the potential reward on this, okay, so it starts going back up above a dollar, and it does it with increased volume. I jump back in, and, hey, I, I sell at $1.25. My reward outweighs my risk every time on a trade like this. So the closer I can get into $1 a share... Hey, this is no brainer. It's not a breakout. It's more of a support bounce, and I'm getting in early. I'm not getting a lot of confirmation, but from a risk reward standpoint, I can lose on uh, seven out of ten trades like this. But those three winners I have should make up for all those little losers. Wow, 
Very cool. Nobody likes being wrong seven out of ten trades. So it's yeah. hard. You know, yeah. it's hard to want to buy this again at a dollar if you've been burned a couple of times. But you know, bottom line is that you know so it's a no-brainer trade. And and you put five cent stop loss. Is that what you're saying? So uh -huh. you buy a dollar, ninety-five cents. That's that's your total risk. Yeah. And and so you know that setup lose seven win three is uh, always a wonderful kind of setup uh, kind of system for traders especially beginning traders who want to take the next step and become intermediate pro traders it's it's really good for them to learn how to trade that kind of a system because the market will always give you that system too, too many other participants want to be right so they sell out and it creates the dynamic that creates those situations where small losses occur and a big a big run and you know so that system is always available in the markets. It's psychologically so difficult for people to actually do. What do you do in your own head when you put on a dollar trade and it gets stopped out at 95 and you do it again and it does it again and now you've got to make that choice on that third time? Is there, is there anything you tell yourself to say, I know what I'm doing. Go after it. <laughs> well, you know, I... You got to have discipline. You got to stick to your game plan. If your game plan says, you know, jump in when it's at support, and it, you know, if it breaks it, there's going to be little, um, yeah. Hey, better safe than sorry. Get out early before it gets a lot worse. So take those little small losses because I know that eventually, if it's just been flirting with that support level, and you know, I, I've seen what it's done in the past. They just keep playing my system, and um, you know, if I have too many losses in a rule, I have to reevaluate and I have to analyze the company and, and you know, hey, what am I missing on this one? Why is it, you know, is something changed? Is the channel a little bit lower? But bottom line, it's discipline. You just yeah. gotta have the discipline to, to follow your game plan. And if your game plan says get in, because it's that support, yeah, get oh. in. It's no emotions. I have no discipline, so uh, I, I, I would die if that were me. <laughs> I always have to have these little gimmicks that help me pass my lack of discipline. I say things like, um, uh, the fact that it loses twice means I've done two great trades and uh, I have to do at least two or three more before they actually pay me. So <laughs> I can't quit now, otherwise I'd be quitting the job before the payday comes. Well, Little things like that are, are, are the mental game that I play to make myself feel like uh, I can keep following this system. But, uh, but it's even better if you just say, yep, I'm going to keep my rules, that's what I do and that, that's worthwhile, and, and that's the right thing to do, and so forth. Well, honestly, I have to do little mental games myself, and if I get in at a dollar and I get stopped out at, at 95 cents, I'm actually patting myself on the back saying, hey, I got out, I followed my rules, you know, I, I, right. I, it was a great trade because my loss wasn't that big, and you know, it bounces back up, and it's hard not to be frustrated, yeah. but, you know. See, I think that's a good mental strategy, to, to, to frame a loss as a good thing, because you've, protected your risk, protect your capital, you followed your rules, and, and, and all of a sudden now you think you're not disciplined, but you say, look, I was disciplined. I showed discipline. I can, I can do it again. And, and, and you have earned the right to another try at that point because mm -hmm. you can trust yourself. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's really cool. Thanks for, for showing that. Um, I think right now if, it's, uh, uh, if we can uh, make this work, Wes, I think... Uh, Time for us to check in on, on the currencies. Now, Scott, I know you've, you've looked at Forex before. Are, are you uh, comfortable giving an opinion on, your, uh, on any Forex pairs along the way? So I, I don't follow the pairs anymore. I can do uh, technical analysis. I used to trade right. Forex, uh, but uh, yeah, as far as the pairs go. Yeah. That's okay. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you uh, an opportunity to jump in. In fact, here's this first one. I'm going to make a comment or two on it. Uh, I've been talking about this past uh, week or so. We've got the Aussie yen, and the thing, the reason I like to watch the Aussie yen is not because I'm, I'm terribly interested in trading it. I'm always interested in a good trade wherever they're found, but, uh, but mainly because the Aussie yen is such a good uh, indicator of uh, worldwide risk attitude. So if people around the world, particularly in non-U.S. Uh, locations, are interested in investing money in some way, then somehow it trickles into uh, the Aussie yen and that has to do with the fact that within Asia you've got uh, a lot of commodity trading going on uh, between Australia and China and so forth and so you've got higher interest rates in Australia lower interest rates in in Japan and a sort of Asian version of the carry trade well, right now the US uh, yen has more interest differential and so so it is the default carry trade but secondarily is, is this one the the Aussie 
Yeah, and, and so uh, I've been watching this because, as you can see, we've got this huge, um, you know, inverse head and shoulders, which is kind of a breakout, and uh, and it's coming back, right? Um, so it, on a horizontal level for, you know, the old highs, it's kind of right there, but uh, I'm of the opinion I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see if it'll, you know, come down a little bit more. Uh, we can grab that and uh, catch a, a new trend uh, ride. So... I know you're familiar with inverse head and shoulders and certainly double bottoms and, and, and pattern breakouts of all kinds. So, so Scott, what do you see here that you think you'd be interested in trying to strategize for a, a trade setup off of this? Well, first of all, I, I recognize the inverse head and shoulders right away. Um, yeah, that, that's a great break through the neckline right there. And then, uh, you know, what do they usually do when they break the neckline? They, they go back and retest it. So if we can get back in potentially on a retest of that. I, I'd love that as an entry, but I've got to ask you a question. So is this kind of a, a double bonus? We can get in, we can go long this pair because the chart is, is telling us to, and we get the benefit of, of it being a good carry trade. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, you got to love that, right? If you're going to be holding it for two, three weeks every night, you're going to get that inf interest differential, which is going to be about the size of the spread, maybe a little more depending on you know which pairs you're trading. In this case here, I think it's it's maybe just the the spread half again or something. And and but but you add that right um, over two weeks, fourteen uh, trading days, and now all of a sudden you're talking about uh, uh, 10, 20 pips uh, bonus. You know that that's just it's gonna carry you <laughs> in that trade, right? And then how many pips uh, between the, uh, the, the, the head and the, uh, the neckline? Yeah, that's the fun thing there. We're talking about a 400 pip height of, wow. of that, that base all the way to the neckline. <laughs> yeah, nice. so, so it, could really, it could really move up into, into this area. You know, over it, uh, it'll take a little time, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting looking trade, so. Do you mind if I point something out real quick? Please. And I, I hadn't heard this. I've been uh, trading for, for a long time. Like I said, penny stocks over 20 years, and I've been in, instructing, teaching people how to trade. But I heard this term recently. I don't know if this is a new thing. Um, let me know if you've heard this, but take a look at the, uh, the double top up there. Yeah, this up here. Sure. I've heard a lot of people calling that the M pattern, M for murder. <laughs> and okay. I hadn't heard that before. It's, uh, I don't know if this is a new thing in, in the trading world, but there is an M for murder pattern right up there. Right there. Okay. So yeah. double top. Is there anything special that makes a double top into an M for murder pattern? Nope. Just looks like a big M. Okay. That's it. So, so basically uh, sharp, uh, not, not rounded double tops no and, and not i guess maybe sharp yeah I, I think that would distinguish it a little bit more i think people are just calling double tops uh just trying to get cute with them and calling them the murder patterns i had i had not heard that but that was definitely murderous to this pair <laughs> <laughs> sure was that's great thanks um all right so speaking of yen pairs here's the dollar yen and this is the the true carry trade uh really taking off and so what's interesting about this especially combined with the Aussie yen, is the fact that it's really telegraphing to us that a lot of people want to take risk all around the world, which is funny because did you get the sentiment that U.S. investors are a little nervous, like, ah, we've been going up six, seven years. Can we really keep going? Aren't we due for a top? Aren't we due for a correction? Due for a bear market here. <laughs> did you hear that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah. yeah all the time, absolutely. right? Yep. Yeah. And, and, uh, and yet this signal, the 56-week pattern I'm, I'm looking at, and a few other things are really showing that it's not that way. Whether it, whether that's actual uh, you know sentiment or not, the the, the behavior, the, the what people are doing is actually putting money to work at, at risk in in various ways. So uh, if if this dollar yen is strong, then dollar anything is likely to be strong. And uh, the Canadian hasn't quite the, the dollar uh, CAD hasn't quite uh, picked up on that yet. So I do wonder here if we've got this opportunity for a, a sort of a pop and a breakout um, of this consolidation area in the Canadian. We did have this quick run right here, and this is the weirdest looking flag pattern. It's like a furled yeah. flag, right? <laughs> uh, so so I, I, I don't uh, trust this pattern I, exactly. I that's mean, a weird chart. That, that is a weird chart, isn't it? So, so maybe a diamond pattern that, that's shifted or something? <laughs> 
uh, it, it does make you wonder. I, I don't know if b because of the, the, this price pattern, things are so weird, whether we can uh, reasonably expect. Either way, though, it's, you know, taking this risk, taking this recent low, um, that's your risk. And then if it, if it hits the top and then breaks, then uh, that's, that's really a fabulous trade. But um, anyway, uh, dollar strong and um, uh, against most currencies. Last one I want to look at, we talked about this one yesterday, the Euro Aussie. Uh, it, it's, it's had a very long term, let me back out a little bit here, very long term upward trend. And Euro Aussie tends to tra tends to trend well, and now that it's broken that trend, um, I'm absolutely curious about where and how to you know trade short on this pair. What do you think uh, based on what we're seeing here, Scott? Big down candle. I, I know you're familiar with this this kind of setup. Not quite a hammer, but you know this elongated doji. Uh, potentially, we see an upward move tomorrow of some size, big, small, don't know. But but what would you be looking to anticipate if you were looking for the next sell place just based on that much pattern so far? Well, the uh, the midpoint of a large candle generally tends to be a good level of support or resistance. So I would be looking for the midpoint plus look at how right where the, the line is across the, the chart at that midpoint, notice how back in the day, yeah. the, the old, bottom of some of those old tails. support, yeah. yeah. So, I'd be looking for what is that? Fifty-eight hundred? Uh, one point yeah, five eight? One five six, one five six hundred, one five six oh seven two. Okay. That number. Okay. But yeah, right in there. So one five six and a little more. That's your range, uh, and that cons uh, um, corresponds to mid candle. I like that. That's really good, and that makes sense to me because you know we get this little upward move, and somewhere in here, right in here, you you take a a shot at it. Where is your stop loss? Well, probably right there. See how that's. Uh, it, it's it's not exactly a gap. It it is a you know gap from from session to to session. It's over the weekend, so that it gaps across the the, the channel or the the trend line rather. Um, but um, you know you could go all the way to the top or you could go all the way to the trend line. I don't think that's necessary. I think you can get that stop right in the upper portion of that gap. And so you you could be looking at a setup which would potentially have you in at around uh, one five six ish and then uh, stopping at 15663 so you know, let's call it 65 pips at the most that you'd have to take uh, meanwhile if we um, if we continue back down to new lows you're at least going to be uh, equal on that and then um, equal and a little more you're going to be a little bit more than 50 50 getting back to the new low plus wherever that continues to trend. There's there's a, a big move here. If we just look at the distance from this to its trend line, uh, you know, 161, clear down here to the break at 156, we're talking about 500 pips. And so if that were to continue on that way, that, that could be a real interesting trade. Well, I'd definitely be nervous about that. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's gone down so far. It, it definitely looks overextended, but we're bearish, right? We're, yeah. we're definitely bearish. And so if it retraces a little bit back up and hits the midpoint of that candle, again, psychological games, right? Yeah. Maybe this is a spot where I take a very small position, mm. and if it does drop down, hey, great, I'm making money. If it goes up further, it gives me a chance to take more of the position I wanted all along. So win-win, right? I see. Yeah, so if you, were, if you were to scale in as it went against you, but in a planned way so that you control your risk, and you could go with the stop loss all the way up to the trend line and, and even profit if it... Uh, if it manages to retest that trend line, by the time you get back to break even, you could be in profit mode. So uh, that's good. Hey, great stuff, Scott. I appreciate uh, your weighing in on some of those things and hope you liked hearing about uh, some of these uh, ideas and, and Scott's experience. And um, we will definitely have Scott back. Scott is part of the gurus that we have that are part of the Trader Continuum and make regular contributions either to our newsletter or to various other uh, uh, subscriber only webinars that we'll be doing and if you like the idea of learning to trade um, through a penny stock system that a 20-year veteran has perfected well you ought to come check that out uh, meanwhile uh, keep an eye on uh, where the US stock markets going and a few of these currency pairs and uh, manage and control your risk and you'll end up trading well until we do this again everybody take care and, and trade well